just say a word here at the very beginning. My heart goes out to you all for what you are suffering this weekend. Certainly, um, probably not the best time for a gospel meeting when you're grieving the loss of someone you love. Uh, but I appreciate you, that you have been here. Uh, appreciate that you're continuing to worship and serve God. And um, my heart breaks for your loss. He sounds like a man I would have loved to have met and known. Th there is something bittersweet, is there not, when a Christian dies? About our reaction or our response when a Christian dies. Bitter in the sense that we are sad for having lost that relationship. Sad for family and knowing what they're going through. But if we are in Christ, and if we believe that the person who died is in Christ, there is something sweet about the death of a Christian. It is a victory achieved. It is, it is a life goal accomplished. And, and so, that, 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 that's an odd combination, I know, but it, it's very comforting to think about one who has dedicated their life to serving God, now finally getting what they have lived for all of their lives. And I hope I don't say anything or do anything this week that would distract from what you all are going through. I appreciate very much the grieving process that you're going through and the loss that you've experienced. Sounds like what I've heard from him, he would have wanted us to be doing what we're doing right now, though. And so I will spend a few minutes tonight trying to share some thoughts with you on our theme this week of who am I? Who am I really? If I am in Christ, then, then what does that mean? Or what are some of the things that that means? And so have you ever heard someone say this? Or maybe you've said this yourself. I'm not a saint. And usually that's the way it's said, right? Oh, I'm not a saint. And what people mean by that is, well, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes or something like that. But if I'm in Christ and I'm thinking about who am, who am I and how am I going to explain who I am, not only to myself, but how am I going to explain to other people who am I, it is extremely important that I know I am a saint. And that's what I want us to think about for a few minutes in the lesson tonight. The idea of sainthood has become so perverted, so twisted, so misunderstood from the way that concept is described in the New Testament. I think it happened maybe gradually, historically it happened gradually over a long period of time, but, but certainly by the Middle Ages. The idea that sainthood was not something that was true of every Christian or every child of God, but that, that, that was a, it was something that was reserved for a very select few group of people. Uh, people who, who perhaps, at least in the world's mind, had accomplished some great spiritual thing, had done some great spiritual thing. And so those people were then designated as saints. If you're still using the old King James translation of the Bible, uh, and nothing wrong with that at all. It, 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 it is a masterpiece of English literature. And it's the translation on which I grew up. I've gone through kind of a, morph, a metamorphosis in regard to translations. I grew up on the King James. I was compelled to move the, to the American Standard Version, the old ASV, when I went to Florida College. Uh, I switched over to the New King James was next, I think. And then the New American Standard, I'm now in the English Standard Version. What that means is, if I'm not careful, and I try to quote the scriptures, it might be a Frankenstein, it might be a Frankenstein version. There's a little bit of the King James, a little bit of the New King James, a little bit of the American Standard. And so the, King, the Old King James is a wonderful book, is what I'm trying to say. But if you, if you have one with you now, and you're using it, and you'll open it up, to Matthew, to the beginning of Matthew, what you will see, it, it will say at the very beginning, the gospel according to Saint Matthew. I, 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 I suspect that that's probably still true. 
the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke. And by the way, it is absolutely true that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James, and Jude were saints. But I suspect that that's not what's meant at the King, the King James Bible when they designate those men as saints. I think it's probably that misunderstanding, that perversion. The Bible teaches, I think, very clearly that all Christians are saints. Every Christian is a saint. Paul, in his greetings to the epistles, very often included something like this, to the saints in Ephesus, or in Philippi, or in Colossae. He also speaks about Christians being called to be saints in both Romans and 1 Corinthians. And, and that's, that, 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 that doesn't mean that they're being called to some special task or some special mission or some kind of special holiness. The idea is that all Christians are called to be saints. As a matter of fact, Paul will use some form of this Greek word 41 times in the New Testament. Sainthood is something that is to be characteristic of all Christians. And I think it's sad and unfortunate and not helpful that the world has come to have such a misunderstanding about this word and what this word means. And so I want to think about a couple of things in the lesson. Really, the, the main lesson is two points. And, and usually if I'm, and when I'm at home at Eastside and if I say, you know, we've got two points in the lesson tonight, I can see faces light up. And, and it's, it, it, it's fun to kind of wipe, wipe that smile off their face by saying, well, now each, each of those two points has ten sub-points. So a little bit, I want to try to develop these two points, but what I want us to think about is what does it mean that the Bible calls us saints? Why, are, why am I a saint? What, what's the significance of that? What does that mean? And I, and I think there are two things that we need to look at. And the first one is this, I am a saint. What that means is I am Christ's own possession. I belong to Christ. The, words that are, the word that is translated saint is closely associated with words the, uh, like sanctify and sanctification. All three of those words come from the same Greek word family. And, and so Paul will write to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. He, he will write to those Corinthians as sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. A saint is someone who has been sanctified, who is called to be sanctified. What does it mean to be sanctified? What does that word mean? Thayer says it means to be separate or set apart from profane things and dedicated to God. A saint is someone who has been set apart. Set apart for what? I, I really think that's, that's not the best way to word that question. Not set apart for what? Set apart for whom? And the answer is set apart for God. Being a saint means I, have, I belong to God. I have been sanctified. I have been purified. I have been made one of God's own people, one of his own possession. As a matter of fact, Peter and Paul use identical expressions to say exactly that. Paul in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 calls us a people for his own possession. God gave himself to purify us, purify for himself, a people for his own possession. Peter uses the same expression in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. One of the old translations says a peculiar people. And, and, and I think that's a good translation. I think that the idea of being God's own possession, something unique about us, something different about us. And what's different about us is that when we obeyed the gospel, when we were redeemed, we were sanctified. We were set apart to be Christ's own possession. It is the language of ownership. We talked about that in one of the earlier lessons. We're going to talk about it in more detail in a lesson later in the week. But the idea that I belong to Christ, as a matter of fact, Paul says it exactly like that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. And so when we think about being saints and what that means, 
When we think about being sanctified and what that means, it means that we now belong to Christ. We, we are His to be used for His glory, to be used for His purposes. And, and so we use, the Bible uses the terminology, we or people today don't use this terminology near, nearly as much. It, it has been my experience, and it seems like maybe more so in recent years, that I run across a lot of people who really seriously want Jesus to be their Savior. And maybe even desperately want Jesus to be their Savior. But they have really no intention of allowing Jesus to be their Lord. Or acknowledging Jesus as Lord. And yet those two concepts are inseparable. Remember in the very first gospel sermon that is recorded in Acts chapter 2. Peter identifies Jesus. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain. To know with absolute certainty. That God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. And the idea of lordship plays in with this idea of sanctification. We now are God's own possession. If I am a saint, I belong to God. And that means then, point number two, that means this. If I am a saint, I am different. Hence the translation in Peter's account and some of the older translations of peculiar people. Peculiar means different. Unfortunately, the word peculiar in our English, modern English language, has kind of a negative connotation to it. If something is peculiar, it's off. It's not right. There's something wrong with it, and nobody wants to be peculiar. And so most of the newer translations have removed the word peculiar and have translated a people for God's own possession, God's own special people, people who belong to God. And because we belong to God, we are intended by God to be different. Believers in Christ have been called to live a unique life, a lifestyle, a different lifestyle, a lifestyle that does not conform to the way that the world is living. There are so many passages that we could look at. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. A reference back to the book of Leviticus. One commentator suggests that called may be too passive a word. I think it's dangerous to start calling words that the Holy Spirit chose too passive. But he suggested that perhaps a better way to understand this would be to read, As he who commanded you is holy. As he who commanded you. It's not a suggestion. This is not Jesus saying, try, try, try the best you can to be holy. You know, just do the best you can. Make a stab at it. Give it a try. We, we are being commanded to be holy. We are commanded to be different, to live differently. I don't know who said this. I ran across this quotation a long time ago. I've had it in my files for a long time. I always liked this. We may choose a married life or a single life. And, and he's talking about if we are Christians, if we are in Christ, we may choose a married life or a single life, but it is not left for us to choose whether or not we live a holy life. Being holy is not an option. It is mandatory that we be different, that we live different lives. Why is, it, why is it that we struggle with that? If this were a Bible class setting, that's the question I'd be asking. Why, why is it that we struggle as Christians so much with the idea of being different? Three things come to mind. One of them is I think we value conformity. We value conformity. Just look, look around. I, I don't see anybody dressed in such a way that somebody would say, boy, that's different. That's unusual. That's unique. But why are we dressed like this? Why, why, why do we wear our hair like this? Why, why are we driving what we're driving? The vehicle's parked out in the parking lot. 
We value conformity. We don't want to stand out, generally speaking, we don't want to stand out from the crowd. We wear the same style of clothes, sometimes talk the latest slang, conform to things that are popular. Sociologists and psychologists, my middle son has a degree in sociology, and he confirmed to me that this is true, that one of the things that people fear as much as they fear anything else is being perceived to be different, odd in some way or another. And, and so we've become kind of an assembly line society. We're terrified of being thought of as different. And that's, that's seriously dangerous way to think about things if we are in Christ, if we are Christians, because God calls us to be different. We are his own possession, his own special people. I think another thing that comes to mind is, is, is that we've only ever seen a caricature of holiness. Maybe you've been accused by somebody because of something you said or something you wore, something maybe you didn't wear, or someplace you went or someplace you wouldn't go. Has somebody ever accused you of trying to be holier than thou? You ever heard that expression? Oh, you folks, you just think you're more holy than all of the rest of us. And we don't want to be thought of as different. We don't want to be thought of as uh, somehow or another morally superior to other people in the world. And, and, and by the way, let me just say, we don't do this so that we can be and take some pride in being morally superior. We do this because we long to be like Christ because we belong to Christ and because this is something to which God calls us and I think third one of the reasons why we struggle with this is because we misunderstand what it means to be holy that we've been we have been fooled by the picture of holiness that, that is promoted by the world holiness the way people who are holy those are people who live in monasteries and and and, and maybe even more seriously the idea of being called to be holy, well, that means I can't have any fun. I can't ever laugh. I can't enjoy life. I have to disdain luxury. And so we don't want any part of that, or people don't want any part of that. And so they walk away from this command to be different. And so I want us to think about what it means to be different. What does it mean to be different, to be a saint and to be different? Let me su suggest to you, th 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 this is really uh, uh, such, a, such an important point. It, it means that we think differently. It means that we think differently. So look what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. This is the New King James translation of that particular verse. Peter says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter uses a Middle Eastern analogy to describe what it means to prepare your minds. During this time, men wore long flowing robes. But if they were going to do some physical labor, if they were going to run, <coughs> they would lift their robes and they would secure them around their waist with a belt or a girdle. And that would allow them the freedom of movement they needed to do whatever it was that they needed to do. That, 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 that is so foreign to the way we think. But we use that same analogy, do we not? Has, has somebody ever told you, roll up your sleeves and get busy? Anybody ever, you've heard that expression? Roll up your sleeves and get busy. We, we, we may not literally mean turn the sleeves of your shirt up. What we're saying is, get ready, get prepared, and do the work. Roll up your sleeves and get busy. Busy. Gird up the loins of your mind. What we're suggesting to you here, first of all, thinking about what it means to be different is, it requires effort. It requires work. You're going to have to get your mind ready. And how do we do that? I haven't heard this, except when I've preached this, I haven't heard this expression in a long time. But when computers first started being popular, there was, uh, and, and uh, computer programmers would, would say something like this, garbage in, garbage out, right? I, I suspect that's still true. Maybe they have a different way of expressing it or saying it now. 
But that's exactly, that's the same thing is exactly true with our minds, is it not? How am I going to get ready to live a different life, to be different because I belong to Christ? I've got to get my mind ready to do that. What am I feeding my mind? What am I putting into my mind? What are the things that appeal to me? What are the things that are important to me? Your behavior will never be holy until your mind is first holy. The author of Proverbs in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, New American Standard Translation will say, as he thinks within himself, so is he. And so to be different, we've got to get our minds ready to do that. We've got to prepare our minds. We've got to know how to be different. And that starts with thinking. I, I think that's what Paul is getting at, or at least part of what Paul's getting at in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. When he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is acceptable and perfect. They may still have these. I think they do because two of my, my two youngest grandsons have discovered these toys. There used to be a toy called Transformers. And the amazing thing about Transformers is I consider myself to be a fairly astute and intelligent adult, but I can never, I can never make the Transformer work. It started out as a truck and it's supposed to turn into a robot and when I'm finished with it, it's broken. I could never make it work. But when my boys were little, I could hand it to my two-year-old son, David, and 30 seconds later, he would hand it back to me, perfectly changed, perfectly transformed. And so I actually took a transformer into a big mistake. I took a transformer into the pulpit one time to preach about Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I practiced and practice, and I'm just, while I'm talking, I'm going to turn this thing into a robot, and but it, did, it didn't work. And it just, but, but, I mean, I really used that, though. You see? You see how hard this, you see how difficult this is? How hard this is to do? But that's the, that, that's the idea here in Romans chapter 2. You've got to transform your mind. We've got to change the way we think. When we become Christians, we become saints. Saints think about God. Saints think about Christ. Saints make every decision with the attitude or the idea, how would God think about this? What would God want? Back in the 90s, remember all the jewelry that some people wore, necklaces and bracelets and things? What would Jesus do? There was a lot of frivolity, I think, in that campaign, a lot of foolishness in that campaign, but, but the idea is rock solid. That, that, that's how we learn to think. What would God want? How would God want me to choose? What, how would God want me to make this decision? And the only way I can know how God would want me to decide, how God would want me to act, how God would want me to live, is I've got to train my mind on what God says, what God reveals in His Word. And so I'm spending time, I'm spending a lot of time in the Scriptures. If I belong to Christ, if I am in Christ, if I am one of God's own special people, a special possession that belongs to God, that doesn't mean I'm not reading other things. And it certainly doesn't mean that there's no joy, that there's no happiness in our lives. But our priority is knowing how to please God. We have to learn to think differently. And, and we won't start acting differently. We won't start living differently until we have conditioned our minds. But that's the second thing, is not only do we have to think differently, we, we have to start living differently. And, and so in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17, And if you all on whom as Father each judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. And so we've got to put those things into practice. And, and what that means is this. Every, every decision that I make, again, every decision that I make, what, how, how, how does this honor God? What, what would God have me do? What would God want? I belong to God. I belong to Christ. Neil Anderson said this. 
What you do doesn't determine who you are. Who you are determines what you do. And I love that quotation. That's exactly what we're trying to say in this lesson about sainthood. What does it mean to be a saint? It doesn't mean that you have performed some miracle. It doesn't mean that you have done some special, extraordinary spiritual thing. It means you understand you belong to God. You belong to Christ. And so everything that we do, everything that we say, is going to be designed to please and to honor them. And, and, and let me tell you this. You know this. I, I think we need to be reminded of it from time to time. But when you stop making your decisions primarily based on what would the world think, and you start making all of your decisions based primarily on what does God want, there are going to be people who won't like that. And there are going to be people who won't like you. Should, should, that, should that bother us especially? That honoring God in how we think and honoring God in how we live is going to make some people angry. And you might not necessarily be the most popular student in the school. As a matter of fact, almost certainly you won't be. And you might not necessarily be the most popular neighbor in your neighborhood. Almost certainly you won't be. You might not necessarily even be the most popular person in your family. If your family doesn't have the same attitude about being a Christian, about being in Christ, about being a saint, about being God's own special possession, about living differently, thinking differently, and living differently, then even family members are not going to necessarily be happy with that. I think one of the reasons maybe, and I'm saying this because I'm saying this from personal experience, uh, th 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 these are battles that I have fought down through the years. Everybody wants to be liked. And again, no nobody really, essentially, nobody wants to be thought of as odd or peculiar or as different. But that's going to happen if we understand and appreciate and put into practice what it means to be saints. To be someone who belongs to God. And so how do we respond to that? Well, Jesus was different. He was different than the religious sects that were common during the time when he was on the earth. And they didn't like him for that, and he was persecuted for that, and finally, eventually, he was killed for that. Do you remember that Paul said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution? Did Paul say that? That's not what Paul said, is it? Let me say it again, exactly like I said it. Paul said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. What did Paul really say? All who suffer, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will, shall suffer persecution. And so I've wondered from time to time in my life, I've wondered from time to time, am I, am I really living the life of a saint? If I'm not being persecuted, if, if everything about my life makes me totally acceptable to people in the world, am, am I really living the life of a Christian? Am I really living the life of a saint? Thinking differently about things? living differently than people in the world live? Who am I? I'm a saint. If you're here and you're a Christian, you are a saint. That means you belong to God. And that means you've chosen to think differently and to live differently, whatever the consequences, whatever the result is. And there may very well be suffering. There will be suffering. When we choose to honor God by living as a saint, by living as his chosen possession. But think about the reward that God has promised us when we get to the other side. 
all the saints gathered together in heaven in eternity. What we suffer here will be so insignificant and so trivial and so unimportant when compared to what we are going to receive when we are in heaven, when we are in eternity with God. But to get there, we're going to have to choose to live as saints. And so think about, that's my challenge to us. This is, this is not an evangelistic lesson, although if you're here and you're not a Christian, we, we certainly would encourage you to think about becoming a saint. Not by being voted on because of some special trait or quality or characteristic that you have, but by humbly rendering obedience to the gospel. You can become Christ's possession, His own special possession. You can become a saint. Most of us here, though, who are old enough to be accountable to God are already Christians. Are you living the life of a saint? Do you understand that you are God's possession? And that what matters in how you live your life is not what is the world going to think about this. It is what is God going to think about this. We are special. We are God's own special people. That's not a brag. That's not a boast. It's just who we are as Christians. We need to be humble about it. It's not something that we boast or brag about, but we are special if we are Christians. And if we are Christians, we're going to live the life of saints, and we're going to do everything we can to tell other people about Christ and encourage them to become saints, to become a possession of God, to change the way they live, to change the way they think, and to conform their lives to God and to Christ and to their will. If you're here and there's any way we can help you to do that tonight, to become a Christian, to make some change in your life as a Christian, to be brought back into a right relationship with God, the saints here are going to stand and sing a song designed to give you just a few moments to think about your spiritual condition. And if there's anything at all that they can do to help or assist you in being what God would have you to be, please make your way down to the front. Let us know how we can serve you right now while we stand and while we sing.